Hello, this is the Circular Economy Forum of the Americas. This is our last session of our 2019 encounter, and we have three specialists with us. First, I want to thank um, ASFD, the ASDF, I'm sorry, uh, which is the main sponsor of this event, and thank Confama, Area Metropolitana, El Valle Aburra, Brica, Ripley, and all our panelists who have been here. And you have been missing this because the camera is facing the other way, but we're in a beautiful setting, the Botanical Garden of Medellin. There's nothing but trees and birds with us, and this has made these two days particularly joyful. Uh, I hope you guys are sitting somewhere as nice as we are. Okay, so we have three guests. Uh, with whom we want to talk about something that has come up several times through these two days and is how we need education on circular economy and on the other side we also need in circular economy education to work uh, for us. Uh, we have Minister Armando Lampe from Aruba. He's the Minister of Education, Science, and Sustainable Development. We have Kevin Dekua here, who's co-founder and the director of ASDF. And we have Nicola Cerantola, which is the founder and director of Ecology. Uh, Minister, can you hear us OK? Yes, it's OK. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Thank you so much. OK, Minister. So first, I would like you to take us to Aruba to understand this world where you're working and where you're trying to promote circular economy so that we get some of the context of your work. Yes, good uh, afternoon, everybody present and those live listening to this um, interesting conference. First of all, I want to thank the organizers, Mr. Kevin de Cuba, for inviting me to participate in this conference. And it was a pity that it was not possible for me to travel to Medellin. And um, it, uh, it is, um, I was, um, always um, dreaming to see the park with the sculptures of the famous sculpturists from Colombia, but maybe another, another moment will be possible to travel to Medellin that is, in a certain sense, Colombia is very close to Aruba. Aruba is a small island and uh, we have um, 30 to 15 kilometers, so you can imagine how small it is. From Aruba, we can see the coast of Venezuela. Santa Marta is very close to Aruba. And a couple of weeks ago, there was a mission from Aruba to Rio Acha because in historically there was a lot of contacts between uh, the Colombian Caribbean coast and Aruba. And if I can recall um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, he defined himself as a Caribbean writer. And his definition of the Caribbean, I think, is one of the best definitions ever heard, that the Caribbean is the region where even the law of gravity is not possible in the sense that the most unimaginable things can happen in this region. And by his identification as a Caribbean writer, that means that there's a lot of lot we have a lot in common between Cartagena, the Caribbean Colombia, and Aruba. And uh, 
The second largest community here in Aruba is the Colombian community. So till today, there is a, a lot of contact. We have daily flights uh, to Colombia. And for me, it's an honor to speak some words um, for a conference organized in Colombian territory. Yeah, we're very, yeah, First we're of very all, thankful for your time. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> and um, I uh, today is Black Friday. And due to the Americanization of the world in a certain sense, because now I think even in Colombia, they organize the, the Black Friday after Thanksgiving in the sense of that people, uh, crowds, they go to buy in a more cheap price all kinds of products. And that is exactly one of the themes about circular economy. On this day, symbolically, Black Friday, we have consumerism is so central this day, while when we talk about circular economy, then we think about a more simple lifestyle. It's quite contradictory. And indeed, I think that um, the that contradiction I've, I have experienced it today because when I walk to the streets, it was very difficult for me to come to my office due to the crowded streets with people trying to buy all kinds of products. And I think many of those products, maybe they don't even use them or they do, are not in need of those products. And then um, before coming to here, I went to a park where the youngsters for the first time organized um, a climate action now um, activity. And because of Greta, Strike Friday, the youngsters from different secondary schools, they organized a meeting exactly on Black Friday um, asking all of us to take action due to the climate change. And some of the youngsters present were also um, activists of a movement here called Scobble Bobble. That is, they um, go to the ocean and they um, regenerate the coral reefs to a special treatment. And they are asking us to ban plastic from the island, from the ocean, and indeed our government has taken that action. And we are, as a minister of uh, education, science and sustainable development, the, it is maybe quite unique, that combination, because most of the times you will find other combinations, education and culture, education and sports. But here in Aruba, we decided to combine education and sustainable development. Because if education doesn't serve the goal of sustainable development, then why education at all? Because if life on our planet is in danger, and if we see the whole universe, it's a quite unique situation we have on planet Earth. The combination of factors that made possible that life is possible, that human life is possible. Maybe it is unique in the whole universe. And if it is unique, then we have to, 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 to cherish what we have received so that the future generations also can enjoy this uniqueness in the whole universe. 
So we have a duty, and that's why I, as a minister, I proclaim the the plan. We call it the Pen 2030. That is the National Educational Plan 2030, aligned with the SDGs 2030. And we have started projects in our schools to promote, indeed, to reforest our schools, to teach the young generation again what it means to plant your own food, etc. And the sustainable development goals have become for us the goals of our educational plan. And besides that, we have also um, uh, decreed the FEC 2050, that is the Circular Economy Vision 2050. It will take 30 years. Why 30 years? Because it, it takes a whole generation to indeed to try to change our consumerist lifestyle. We have been so educated that development means growth, sustainable development. We have talked about it. I'm the Minister of Sustainable Development, but theoretically there is a problem with that concept because development, to develop means to grow. And how can growth, economic growth, be sustainable? It's, it's practically a contradictio in terminis to speak about sustainable development. And that's why we are saying that maybe another name for sustainable development is now circular economy. And could I stop you there? Because I would love to hear what your background is. You're now speaking as one of us, you know, as a preacher of circular economy. But how did you get there? What happened in your life that made you look into circular economy as a potential solution for the problems in Aruba? Yes. The, our small island depends on tourism. We, for 100%, that's our only industry that we have. And we have seen already the attraction, the main resource to have to survive here on the island is thanks to the nature that attracts tourists. Although we have only what more than 100,000 inhabitants, we receive more than 2 million tourists a year. So it is a huge industry for such a small island. And we have seen already why the, that our beaches do not have the quality anymore as before. We have seen our coral reefs are being damaged. So exactly what is attracting and it, it is our economical survival uh, strategy is being threatened by the disbalance, the not harmonious way of um, looking into economic development and natural development. So that's why that was one of the key reasons why we have um, uh, started to look into this direction. And we know that um, the first victims of the climate change will be the small islands. We've seen it already in the Pacific Ocean. And that's why at the latest UNESCO conference some weeks ago in Paris, my, I pledged for that the small island states development, small islands issue has to become a global priority for the UNESCO 
and for the United Nations. We know that gender is now a global priority, but also the small islands have to become a global priority because it is not only a Caribbean problem. It is not only a regional problem. It is a global problem if we continue this way. Right. In my perception, and I want to ask you this, being a small island is both a problem and somehow an advantage to be more sensitive to this world of problems. Yesterday we had Carlos Bernal who was talking to us and telling about Ellen MacArthur going to her sailboat and perceiving that she had no running water, so she had to make good use of the resources she had. And then Peter Desmond telling us about the experience in Africa where poverty as a perception of limited offer of resources was probably the driver of what he called a circular continent. So a continent that has a lot of behaviors that match circular economy. Now, in your case, you're in this very small island. Do you think that small islands have that perception of limited resources that could help decision makers be more sensitive to these sort of approaches towards environmental management? Yes, it is. In, this ca in many cases, being a small island can be a disadvantage. You have limited resources, human resources, financial resources, and uh, we are very limited in, in many areas. But uh, in this uh, particular theme of circular economy, our small scale is an advantage because it is, in the first place, it is more feasible to um, raise awareness among a small population about this issue. Because talking about circular economy, rightly, as you said, is talking about a new lifestyle. And that's the most difficult thing that is. It is so difficult, maybe it's the most difficult thing, to change the behavior of a human being. We are so accustomed to our consumerist society that how can we make that change? That's why we called the Our Plan 2050 to express it takes a generation to reach that more simple lifestyle. But I have hope among the young generation, the youngsters, they are much more aware and and I think because they know that within 30 years, they have to survive on this planet. We are already gone. So the, it is, I have seen that, that uh, with the youngsters, our message is coming true. And that's why we are focusing us in our strategy on education, to educate the youngsters in this direction. And... Um, in, in um, the second thing is that in a small scale economy, it is easier to transform it into a circular economy. When you do, we, here we have with 100,000 people, it's easier than when you are dealing with 100 million people. And uh, so, uh, we are in that sense, uh, you are right that 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 the, the small island uh, situation can be in our favor in order to turn to this team of circular economy. Great. Well, you also have the challenge of all this incoming raw materials that you need and incoming inputs where the country probably has little control. Uh, okay, now we were talking this morning about a new Colombian national strategy for a circular economy. You just mentioned that there's a circular economy vision for 2050 for Aruba. And um, my feeling here is that in Latin America, 
taking policies into actions into something that you can really materialize takes a very long time and that we have been working a lot on developing new policies and perfecting them we even have second and third versions of the same policies but we don't see them implemented what is your strategy what is the approach that you're taking in aruba to make sure that the private sector and the public sector because you have to talk to other sectors for example the tourism sector which i'm sure is the most important from what you just said Uh, how do you talk to them to convince them to turn these strategies into actions? Yes, uh, today I can mention two examples. This evening I have two events that will show that also the private sector and other NGOs are involving now in this direction. We have this evening the opening of a factory store that is a plastic recycle center. And um, it is a businessman who started this um, initiative. And it means that the private sector is taking seriously the, the message. Then later in the evening, we have the closure of the bike week because um, the uh, yesterday, the whole day on all the schools, we, we, we promoted a, a video, uh, a film uh, promoting the culture of using the bicycle because one of the, the I think, one of the best ways to contribute to a more healthy world is um, using public transportation and using the bicycles and stop using the cars. And we have too many cars here in Aruba. And uh, so and this evening, uh, a group of people, they will um, uh, ride 16 kilometers with the bicycle and then having also a, a um, finishing with the film about the culture of bicycles in the Netherlands. And uh, so those are two initiatives on the same evening that shows that both in the society as in the private sector, we are seeing some movement in the right direction. Those are great examples. Thank you so much. Uh, Minister, I have a question. How long will you be in the government? Um, I beg your pardon, what was the question? Uh, what's the term of your government? For how many more years yes, will yes, you be the, in the, the government? The term is still 2021. Okay. It is a four-year term. Great. So, our, in a certain sense, our last year of real action is 2020 because in 2021 we have election time okay so from my own experience when you're at the government there are many things you want to do and there are a lot of things that you start but you pick your children you know those two or three things that you really want to accomplish. Do you have a goal like that? Like something that you would really like to see, finish, done, well established before you leave the government related to circular economy applications in Aruba? Uh, yes. I would like to see uh, accomplished our, as a Minister of Education, the curriculum of, um, uh, we call it education in nature and environment, and that is to a, um, a series of lessons in, at different grades of our schools so that the children and youngsters um, learn what it means to recycle, to reuse, 
and um, to um, be uh, more participatory in um, the whole natural uh, environment. That's why we have opened also a botanic garden so that and all kinds of greenhouses in the different schools. We that, So my I, I hope that we can accomplish this, that the curriculum can be renewed of our schools um, before I finish my term in this direction of um, education in nature. That is a great goal. Thank you for picking education as your goal. Okay, now we understand that you only have a few minutes with us. So I want to ask you this last question because you will be the host of the next CEFA encounter. We will be in Aruba next year. What do you think we're going to be surprised to see in Aruba and to learn from Aruba when we visit your island? Yes. In the first place, I um, want to welcome you all, say bon bini, we say here to our guests in 2020. 2020 will be a crucial year uh, for us uh, as a government. And that's why it's also so symbolic that we will host the conference uh, about circular economy with CIFA 2020 here in Aruba. And the island is, when we talk about circular economy, we also have to think about uh, the human beings. And uh, really, you will see a, uh, a friendly island, a secure, very safe island. And um, what is maybe interesting for you is that we are till now outside the hurricane zone. So you will, you will visit us exactly the time when the hurricane period has finished for the Caribbean. And we have taken for granted that we are so blessed being outside the hurricane zone because maybe that will not last forever due to the climate change. So it is um, that will, I think you will uh, experience um, this environment here in Aruba. Um, you will enjoy uh, our beaches, but you will see also the challenges that we have here that due to the economic success of our tourist industry for nearly 50 years, the, it is the stress that there is to maintain nature in harmony with the economic development. You will see that it is not easy for us to preserve, to keep the nature that is our main attraction. You will see deforestation here in Aruba taking place due to the, 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 the pressure for more economic development. So I think you will see also those, those contradictions when you visit us. And that's exactly the, 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 the core of the discussion within the circular economy specialists. How um, how can you manage you know, the economic development and at the same time being respectful towards nature and towards our planet? And uh, somehow we have lost that wisdom, what our former indigenous cultures, they were, they, they, they had that wisdom, but we have lost that and we have to again no, um, get uh, that wisdom back. And that's why we are so pleased to have you here next year, because with your ideas, with your experience, with your background, you can contribute uh, to our uh, island to, um, to have again, let me call it the circular economy wisdom. 
That is great. Thank you for your words. I'm not going to take more time from you. Uh, you have uh, an appointment with the bikers. So enjoy biking in your island. And thank you really very, very much for making education in environment and nature one of your main goals. Always at your service, Bombini Naruba, Cefa Binti Binti. Gracias. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, that was great. So we have very similar challenges everywhere. Uh, okay, now we're going to start discussing exactly what the minister was talking about, education, because everything starts with the coming generations and everything starts with changing behaviors and we humans are like have a weird setup that we get when we're young and when we're kids and it's very hard to change it. So education is a very important part of circular economy and I am by far not an expert in circular economy. I am a very interested stakeholder because I have worked with environmental issues forever. Uh, and I have been here through this one day and a half, and I have heard that circular economy involves design, but then it involves materials, but then it involves processes and life cycle and um, industrial ecology, industrial symbiosis, uh, waste management, rescue recovery. These are like really a lot of issues that are coming together and need to be understood by a generation of decision makers who doesn't know how to separate organic from recyclable, right? So we have a very confused public and a very confusing message, probably. I am sure that with all the expertise that Kevin and Nicola have, they have had to find some sort of way to explain to people what circular economy really is. So first I want you to tell me what is that pedagogical model that you have hidden in your pocket and you take out when people have no clue about what you're talking about. Uh, let's start with Nicola. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Well, I, I remember my first steps in the in the field, no, like ten years ago, and I was uh, getting around like an entrepreneur in the networking and looking for some food and wine. You know, as, as an entrepreneur, you have you don't have resources, so you have to take advantage of these kind of events. And it was very crazy because I I was introducing myself and saying I uh, working in the field of eco design, and I needed like forty minutes to explain to people what was that about. Uh, I believe that in these 10 years we decreased to 30 minutes, so <laughs> we, we achieved something. But I believe uh, there was a lot of misconception, misunderstanding, that everyone was thinking about eff uh, energy efficiency or putting some solar panels somewhere. So I believe that st we are still in the, facing this challenging um, phase where we have to, to be able to transmit a message but with the right complexity to don't be trivial, trivialized, there is something that is happening with the circular economy. The end, when we are trying to explain to average people or an average a person in front, in front of us, we need to have the same, the language that is understandable for those that are not experts or they have been not in the field for so many years. But also we need to try to keep the standard very high, no? to, to don't deviate, divert what is the real meaning of things. No? So I believe this is a, a challenge that we are still on. I don't know if Kevin is, is in my st same challenge or in the war to, to find the, the right way to do it. Yes, it's a continuous struggle because uh, you're interacting with so many different people from society. Uh, so I guess we all have that, that sometimes you get a chance and opportunity to speak with public sector representatives that have a completely different day-to-day -day reality, a different level of responsibility, uh, while comparing with uh, school uh, children, right? And, uh, and the art is trying to explain something very highly complex 
uh, you know, we're talking about a paradigm shift. We're talking about really a syst systemic change in our presence here as human beings on this planet Earth and try to com uh, translate that complexity into easy words, easy examples, and being able to to, to be able to, to get the, the message across, you know, so that, so that the, the individual can walk away and say, or either feel inspired and say like, wow, okay, great, this is my, this is my eureka moment. Finally, I found a purpose in my life that makes sense because that for me was, was the, you know, the, the, the cradle to cradle thinking was for me more than 10, 15 years ago, my eureka moment, thing, thinking, okay, this makes for me finally rational sense and I'm going to uh, spend, you know, my future, you know, a professional life in, you know, dedicating a lot of energy and time in trying to bring this across the board with whoever I speak and interact with. So uh, we did not answer your question about what no, is Turkey economy. <laughs> but I guess no, you did not. <laughs> I believe if I can add something about this, I, I believe that the the um, success that circular economy as a concept has been uh, gaining in these years, in the recent, uh, recent years, is that it was able to synthesize something that was very complex in something that was in the same jargon of the business person, no? so in the same jargon of the politicians. So I believe that sustainability, that it has been around for decades, right. but so far we, we were like uh, attacking, you know, uh, like uh, oil uh, platform in the ocean. So that, that was the type of sustainability that we were trying to, to rise up the, the awareness of people. But I believe that circular economy had the, the great power to be able to get more in, inside the society, be able to, co to uh, involve and engage more actors, more uh, important stakeholders in the society. This is not uh, a sort of final solution, but it's a first step because at the end, sustainability it has been affected by a lot of prejudice in all of these years. So when we were, when we were talking about sustainability, and we are still a, a bit related with that, it's like oh my god, another is 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 here again talking about the penguins and the polar bears, etc. So I believe we need to find also other ways to communicate the importance of this by maybe inspiring people or seducing people with the beauty of this because at the end uh, I believe your Eureka and my Eureka was the same I was I was in Mexico so say hello to the Mexicans that are uh, uh, watching us uh, and uh, for me it was a shock to see a big uh, sea turtle feeding itself or herself in the in the 10 meters away from the shore in Nakumal and for me it was a, a big shock to, to, to see that so sometimes I believe that sustainability, it looks like that we are, okay, we are struggling to survive. Like, like, like if we were cockroach, you know, that we have to survive because we have to, while we are skipping the, the purpose of everything that is enjoying life also. No? So maybe it's the message that we have to change also. That's a very good point. Yeah, interesting. And uh, I, I actually, I have been thinking a lot yesterday and today about how hard it is to communicate sustainability because you know just traditional economy has this simple way of communicating there's demand there's offer there's a uh, raw material and there's waste and you know that's very easy to understand but then we start talking about externalities and then we start talking about the tragedy of the commons and then we start talking about green growth, green economy, orange economy, and now circular economy. So what makes, what do you think, because you're preachers for circular economy, why do you think that is the, the approach and the language that the world should embrace? I think, um uh, the, the basic uh, fact is that we all, as human beings, have to realize that we depend on nature for mm -hmm. satisfying all our needs and starting from basic needs like the fresh air that we breathe day in, day out, 24 hours, right? The, the access to clean water, you know, uh, food, all, all those are provided by nature. So I think that 
because of several reasons, we as human beings have become so detached from that reality that, uh, for instance, if you go to New York City, you walk uh, you know, around in Manhattan, you'll be amazed to see you know, how human beings are able to create a concrete jungle, literally, and you ask yourself, like, where, where is the connection here between what we are able to create and realizing the fact that we still, regardless of what we do, we will continue to depend on the nature and the ecological services uh, that nature offers us. So that is the first point of, uh, of recognition of, that we all have to be conscious about, that on planet Earth, this whole, this little blue planet, uh, it has only a certain amount of resources and you know, uh, biodiversity or nature that can offer us and continue to offer us in the future the ecological services that we need simply to survive, simply to remain present on this planet Earth because nature will continue to evolve regardless of whether we are on this planet or not. The, the interesting discussion also about circular economy is that this is a, not only a technocratic uh, element, uh, element to it, mm -hmm. but it has everything to do with us as human beings. It's to our own interest, yeah. you know, to our own benefit that and we have to make sure that we change the way we live, thrive, and make decisions on a day to day basis. Right. And for urban uh, people, that is, and that's including me, I, I became a biologist and then, you know, connect a little bit more to nature, but you can live as an urban person without even caring about natural environment because you, you don't see the value chain. You don't see how far your mouth is reaching out because, you know, that food is coming from somewhere or the clothes you're wearing and urban people are the ones who are making decisions. It's not rural people, and the world is becoming more urbanized every time at a very fast pace. So the, the challenge is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, do you feel that there is a change? Because I'm, I'm speaking from you know, a very old generation, but do you think that there's a change in new generations that maybe they are a little bit more connected? Uh, if I can add something about what we were discussing earlier, or so before, as we, we are trying yeah. to evade, uh, evade uh, oh, my we are, <laughs> yes, <Thank> absolutely, <laughs> okay. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for your patience. And uh, I, I believe that what, I will, what, what I will, I've been trying in these years is, I, I remember that I started to skipping the polar bear parts, Mm -hmm. And I start saying, okay, I have to create a presentation where I have to say about the numbers. So we are going to talk about risks, about what is happening. If you are not embracing this new religion that is coming out, that is called circular economy. And, and, and then I start in introducing other elements like humor, like um, including very visual images to try to move the emotions of people. And, and in, the, in these 10 years... Can you describe them to us? Sorry? Could you describe them to us? Yeah, for example, I mean, if you are trying to, to deliver a message, you, you, you can just use a very beautiful image with one word. You don't need, like, a technical report information for that. You, you are delivering... You have 15 minutes, 45 minutes to deliver a message, and the message can be very complex, but you can do it in a very straightforward way. You, you don't need, I mean, you need to practice for that, of course, but what I'm trying to say is that how many chances do we lose every day to deliver a valuable message because we get lost in superficial things? I mean, at the end, you assist to, any, to a sustainability event, and everyone is getting there with their PowerPoints full of text. And at the end, and two minutes away that, you, that this, the presentation starts, you lost the conversation. You lost the point. And at the end, after one hour of listening to someone, you say, OK, but what was this circular economy about? I didn't understand. I did get the point. So the question is, is our responsibility as communicator, as professor, as people that are trying to 
spread this word is our resp responsibility to be able to do it in the right way. How many very uh, scientific or very uh, skilled and trained people are out there talking about circular economy and what is the result? Maybe we are uh, freaking the people away, you know, because we, we have a great responsibility. So maybe introducing some aesthetics, some humor, something that is enjoyable. Why, when we are learning, we have to suffer? Why it has to be like a martyr, you know? That you are there like, <laughs> like in chains, listening to someone. So, and I've been learning this in ten, these 10 years because I, I try to test this humor thing, no? Mm -hmm. To put some memes, for example, or something that is funny. Why we can learn? Why we cannot learn by enjoying what, what, what we are listening? You can deliver the message, but in a more funny way, no? Mm -hmm. So you can alternate, for example, a very tough data about what is the eutrophization level of the sea. You can do it. But you can put also something nice after because you have to balance this. No? So and I've been balance positive and negative yes. messages. Yeah, because at the end it's like a movie, no? Mm -hmm. If the movie is everything, everyone is dying every five minutes, at the end <laughs> someone is like, oh my god, let's see, let's, let's this stop terrible. this. <laughs> so you need to I mean the what is the um, the ability to capture the, the interest of people in series, for example, no? The ability to follow a narrative that is engaging people and they say, okay, I want to see the next episode. Are we doing this in education? Are we doing this when we are disclosing things? I don't think so. So if you try to these elements like you more like memes, like trying to be more enjoyable, I've been test testing this with children, with top level managers, and everyone was laugh laughing. So at the end, it worked. So what I'm trying to say is that even if we are going to a very official events, trying to apply this kind of strategy can be working out. You have to practice, of course. You have to. You you might take some risks, mm -hmm. but the risk of not doing anything is bigger, I think. So getting to your question, I cannot remember it now. It was whether it was easier to people, talk to the, the new people. generations okay. who are maybe more connected than us to nature. I don't know. No, I believe that the question there is: a young generation they are absolutely uh, disappointed with the way, generally speaking, with the way they learn. So I believe the the the. the the teaching pedagogical structure, the process, the, the way they are inside buildings with artificial lights, and they are not understanding why they are studying that kind of things, and they are not inspiring them. So I believe that if we want to embrace circular economy, we have to take the, the latest technologies, even analogical technologies in education, to apply to our contents, because if not, we are getting in the same mistake that we have been doing for these centuries, no? that we are delivering a message like, like, like if it was like a package that you are receiving from, from I don't know, from uh, Amazon, and it's like, okay, mm -hmm. so I'm just opening and okay. So, but is, is, are, are you getting the people, the hearts of the people or not? So I, I believe the young, for, for, for us, young people are the, highest challenge because we are playing our future with them and every time when we we miss opportunity to speak and get their hearts we are losing a great opportunity because they are starting to generate some sort of no no please i was yesterday and i talk about secret economy oh my god i i i hope n n never again you know so this I is our responsibility circles and i hate economy yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I fully agree with what you say uh, in the sense of uh, changing the narrative to a positive one because I've been struggling with that too in the sense that I guess many people have gotten um, used to the fact that when you start addressing a topic you first have to start with a problem analysis you know shake them up make them afraid you know and try to to create a reaction but lately I'm more uh, I'm thinking that the best way is simply don't skip that whole part. Let's just, you know, focus on the positive intentional goal of what we want to, where we want to go. And, uh, and I see that the reaction is more positive in that sense when, you know, because nowadays there's so much news already out there 
You know, every day you hear about whatever other crisis uh, around the globe, and people are saturated. And if you start saying, ah, oh, let's, you know, walk down the, the list of all the problems we have, before you know, <laughs> the attention span will, will be finished and you're done. And so if you start with a positive intent, and now I'm coming back to the original question about what is circular economy, uh, I do think that circular economy, in my definition, is it's a unique opportunity for us as human beings to finally figure out a way to live in harmony with our environment, you know, without hampering or impacting our own ability to satisfy our needs and for the future generation. So it fits perfectly with the sustainable development definition. Mm -hmm. And it allows you also to recognize that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, for some reason or, or another, uh, we are the only species on Earth that has not figured that out. If you look into nature, you know, all the other species on this planet have a role to play, a positive and added value into the ecosystem or the whole, you know, the wider system. Uh, every nutrient, every uh, material, every, let's say, yeah, nutrient that is used is converted into another nutrient and nothing becomes waste. Everything becomes an asset for another process. And that's why this is the inspired, the circuit economy is inspired by that, like looking at natural cycles that occur in the eco ecosystems. And for somewhere, some, some reason, nature is already perfectly designed, you know? And somewhere, somehow, we as human beings have think, or I, I might even say the word, we have become so arrogant that we think that we can create stuff and live above and independent from the, um, from the basic rules of life. And uh, that disconnection, I think the next generation is more, uh, uh, say that, sensitive to that, uh, in the sense that um, what we are experiencing right now as, as human beings on a day-to-day -day life, all the news that we hear around, of course, the, the younger generation absorbs all that energy, all that information, and they know that there's definitely something wrong right now, you know? They cannot define what it is. They cannot, you know, pin, pinpoint. But they know that what we are doing right now is not correct. So I think they're more sensitive and more open to new ideas that make r logical or rational sense to them, compared to the older generations that have had, you know, what you just mentioned earlier. The, the education system is set up in such a like a military style, you know, put in, you know, in, in boxes, and you just have to listen you know, to whatever the teacher has to, to say. You cannot even comment in most of the ca cases, you know. Uh, it's not like a, uh, you know, two-way two direction. Very hierarch hierarchical. So, of course, there's a discontent, and of course there's like a, a feeling of like, why the hell should I go into school? I mean, what is the, you know, what am I going to get out of this? And where does it fit in my day-to-day -day reality? How can I become... Uh, you know, a future professional or citizen that is more coherent with, you know, the basic rules of life. And so... Yeah, and as you're talking, I was uh, thinking that I, I use a very similar approach. I talk to decision makers all the time, so ministers and, you know, like even presidents. And I found that it was easier if I was not talking to the president, but to the person who is beneath all those envelopes that made him president and education sometimes, you know, they just start wrapping us up with different labels. So first they tell, you know, you're a girl and you're a boy and that has different implication. And that's in a very, very early age. And then they tell you, uh, I don't know, you're a student, you're a football player, you're, you're a professional, you're a mechanical engineer, you're an industrial engineer, you're a biologist, right? And you start putting up those labels until you get to the president or the king label, right? And it's like all those layers are isolating you from going, to, from having a contact to the very nature of yourself with this which is nature itself, and uh, 
this is very tacky, but when I saw that image in Avatar in the movie, you know, when these guys, they, you know, they take their hairs and they plug them into the tree, that's what I feel that we need to do. But if in between your hair and the tree, there are a ton of, you know, iron layers and steel layers, then that's never going to happen. And I don't know. Uh, I'm just joining the conversation, <laughs> but but I just feel that that's the the hardest part of finding a pedagogical approach is to to get to the person, not to the position, not to the title, not to the institution, but to the person. I can add some some thoughts about this. First is um, uh, first related with how can we seduce companies or high levels to join this in the war and and getting back to my experiments in this way is okay if i remove the penguins because people they don't have penguins at home so they have they are not empathizing with that so start with the numbers so if you are not recycling antimony you are going to run out of antimony so your business is not working anymore in 5 years no but I, 10 years after these experiments, I get to the conclusion that we need to reintroduce the penguins <laughs> in the <laughs> equation. And uh, because we can start, we can try to convince people by pure number. But at the end, it will be the emotion leading the decision. So at the end, you, we needed circular economy because it was showing us a jargon, a way of showing data that was very practical, very attuned to the business perspective, but at the end, we are not uh, successful if we are not able to engage and seduce people to be able to love this kind of thing. So this is for the first part of the, the hierarchy of who is talking to who or how can we implement this. And then getting back to the young, because I believe it's important, is it's true that they are, I'm positive, a percentage, I will not say how much, <laughs> because there is another side effect of this, of the modern society, is the immediate, immediate, the, the readiness, instant satisfaction. So the problem is that the market is giving us the illusion that everything is at our reach with just one click. And in one hour, hour it will be at, at your home. This is not life. This is not life. And what is happening from the educational perspective is that we are accustoming and, and giving uh, the students the idea that life is like that. And the question is, are the young generation able to bear the frustration of the the hard times? So this is the question is, it's true that they are more open to um, absorb new contents. They understand, even if they are uh, absorbed by their mobile phones, that the situation has to change. But our time to deliver the message is approximately of seven seconds. Because it's the time that they have to listen to us. So it's the reason why our challenge as educators of speakers or whatever is that we have to deliver the message like a bullet and the bullet has to contaminate the body of the people and start making them to break down the flows the normal flows of society there is a linear flow i mean we are embedded in a world that is leading us to a consumerism consumerism uh, behavior because everything around us is uh, is designed to capture our attention, to generate fake needs, to generate the anxiety to purchase things. So how can we, and, this, and here we are starting to talk something that is politically incorrect and it should be in the circular economy because every time that we talk about circular economy, it's like, okay, circular economy is doing more with less. No, it's also re rethinking why we are doing things. So the, the, the concept of economy itself, why, why do we need economy? To satisfy our needs and generate well-being and happiness, or what for? To talk about secret economy? So secret economy is becoming the, the objective 
of the conversation. So we have to talk about economy because economy, economy, economy. Okay, but the economy in the in the in the first part of our history as, as humankind was how can we deal peacefully with the scarcity of resources? It's peacefully, because it, if we are not doing peacefully, I will take your stuff from you at, at any cost. So how can we change the culture? Education is is like a if it's a, a vicious cycle where if we are not educating for new va for different values we are not able to generate a different culture and this different culture is very is preserving the status quo so the education system mostly focus on the young people we need to start poking them and provoking them that this is not going to lead them to happiness i mean this model that we have even if instagram and other social networks are, are, um, are changing our perspective of, of what is right, what is wrong, what is, what is the, if we ask to a young people, what is the, your concept of success in life? Being in a swimming, infinite swimming pool in Bali, like this, looking at the elephants over there or whatever, is this reality? Is this the, the, the this is going to lead you to a happy life or not? Or is the social relationship that we are destroying by consumerism or by the capitalism? Because the concept of uh, consumerism is, I, I don't need you. 50 years ago, I would have need you for the eggs, for the chicken, for helping me with the building my house. But nowadays, we live in a city, in an in a urban environment, and I can work online. I, I don't need any human person because I can chat by a chatbot to purchase something over there or if I have a problem I just send an email. So what is the relationship relationship that we are losing? Is so, human so are you saying that you're becoming more antisocial? Yes, of course. Of course because, because of it's a matter of need it's a matter of development. Need. If you don't need other people to survive, even if we are getting crazy about that, because people get we are, our society is getting crazy because we are still not understanding that our other human beings and our social, the quality of our social relationship is the core, is the, is the, is the, the, the reason for our happiness, for our well-being. And, but the market replaced this need for others with everything. You can go to the supermarket on the, online and purchase whatever you want. That's true, yes. But and we're then, primates. Then, then we, we, we live in groups. We have to go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, leeway to to also talk about the the aspect of uh, social inclusion because uh, what I've noticed in the past few years working in this region uh, compared to other regions in the world, the focus here is much more on you know uh, the social well-being of of you know the communities like. Why else are you going to promote circular economy? I mean, uh, talking about the, the end goal, like the overarching goal, uh, it should obviously lead to improvement of livelihoods, you know, of everybody. And then the question is, okay, which formula are we going to use to bring that about? In my case, I think, I think it starts with, uh, from a technocratical perspective in the sense that um, the problem that exists right now in a linear economy has a lot to do with simply the fact of how a group of people, meaning the manufacturers or people that design things and make a decision of creating something from an, uh, a conceptual ID, uh, they still need to add additional aspects in into their uh, decision-making list, let's say. And that includes, for instance, uh, how can I make sure that when I design something, it's designed, you know, anticipating uh, the future potential implications that it may have, you know, in, the, in its value chain? Yeah, and I like that conversation because we've been talking about how we need to educate around circular economy. And this is another aspect of education within this challenge that we have and is how we should change education so that it serves circular economy. Uh, what's your background, Kevin? What's uh, your undergrad? Environmental engineering and uh, energy materials. There you go. So you are an environmental engineer. 
do you feel that you got enough tools while you were getting your technical education to think in terms of circular economy? I would say that I, I would be very extreme in this in the, same, in the sense of saying that environmental engineering or environmental sciences should not even have existed. You know why, why I'm saying this? Okay. It's because this is the environmental... End of the <laughs> Because environmental engineering, what they teach you, you know, in your academic preparation is simply saying, okay, these are the, the methods, the tools, the technology, etc., to solve a problem created by someone else. Or okay. you are tasked to remediate a contamination generated by someone else. You are trying to, you know, your, your whole uh, expertise is just trying to solve someone else, the lack of understanding and ability to do these things correctly. Mm -hmm. So, in essence, if we go then to the root of the problem, we go back to what I just uh, initiated with, in the sense of it's all about how we conceptualize new things, stuff, how we make them, which is the, you know, the, the origin, uh, origin of most of the problems we have nowadays and identify as environmental problems. You know, contamination to the soil, to the water, to the air, for a large fraction of you know the reasons mm -hmm. when you go back to the source it's because we do not think further we don't think uh, in use our collective intelligence to create stuff that are coherent with our nature with with coherent with you know with with the cycles with the needs with the processes mm -hmm. there is where there's a significant challenge and problem and uh, sometimes I get astonished because Every six months, we are able to produce or come out with a new microchip that is, uses nanotechnology and whatever and has triple the capacity to, to store in, information or whatever. So we have knowledge, we have intelligence, we have skills to do this. And how is it possible that with all that knowledge that we have on this globe, we've not figured out the most basic aspect of designing and making things that are coherent with natural cycles? For our own benefit. I mean, yeah. it's not, and, you, and I'm not saying this, this is goes against business. No, it's a, it's a complete different way of bringing about a business. It's a completely different way of producing stuff that help you satisfy the need of, you know, of us as human beings. Do you feel that there is an area of knowledge that is actually being useful, you know, and it's putting forward new innovative ideas to think in terms of circular economy and like with whom should we be working and I'm, I'm thinking designers material engineers like which I, is the, I, I, the, I really the believe, that knowledge i really believe in having I, I, and i talk a lot with Iman about this mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that we think that the solution or the group as, as you would may want to identify mm -hmm. are the creative people Creative people, in a sense, like you don't have to be a specialist, you know, you, you know, a circuit economy specialist or engineer or whatever. No, it's, it's it comes from a group of people that that are not bounded to a particular, you know, uh, label, as you indicated earlier. You know, they don't want to be labeled. These these are people that think beyond a particular silo. They they interact with all kinds of people of of society. They are eager to learn eager to learn from other disciplines and use all that information use all that knowledge to come with something coherent and out of the box different you know that's why it's not for nothing that sometimes you know you have the diff you know festival disruptive innovation festival of alan MacArthur foundation and others mm -hmm. the words chosen for these things are not for nothing it's all about reflecting where our attention should be our attention for realizing a transition towards a global circuit economy starts there our intentional design of good stuff that are in line with nature to allow our economies to become restorative and regenerative that is the the essence of all this you know and all the other aspects in my way of seeing this if you do this part correctly starting from a technocratical perspective it will have positive implications to all the other spheres of society 
meaning social inclusion, better, uh, better quality of life, you know, improvement of livelihood and all these other aspects. Because if we don't solve that, that minor thing that for many, they still see it as a minor issue. No, this is the underlying problem behind all this. Because if we solve this, then we can start talking about systemic change and change the macroeconomic system. But if we don't start with a little nitty and gritty of the essence of this, I don't see where, how or when we will ever, ever reach to a real circular economy or as Ken likes to mention, a sustainable circular economy. Yeah. I can add something about this. I mean, there are two different topics that are coming out from this. The first one is related with the, the concept of generalist and specialist. For example, in my case, I'm a mechanical engineer, but I'm a proud generalist. It means that I'm not the most expert person in life cycle assessment. I don't care. I don't wanna. I prefer be less expert, but, but know about 1,000 disciplines. And this is the question. And this is something that we, is a, is a character or a, pro, a, a business and professional career or profile that is emerging. It is the combination of different, of different skills, attitudes, disciplines. So it's, the hybridation is the key because mm -hmm. you still need the nano nano, nanotechnology scientist. Mm -hmm. Or the example that I used to use is uh, you need to the mechanical or the civil engineer that is calculating, estimating the size of the pillar of the bridge. That's that's amazing because you need these kind of people, but you need more people that are deciding if, where, and when the bridge has to be built or not. And this is the question. So, circular economy from the, the education perspective is opening the, the the need to generate a, to create a new generation of professional. There are a mix between anthropologists, uh, environmental scientists, uh, big data scientists, uh, marketing marketer. Because at the end, when when I'm speaking about circular economy, it's like a 360 degrees travel around the human civilization. So you are talking. Because you are traveling around the world and you see they are people are trying to make a living there. This is circular economy also. It's not only the hyper-technological process in Switzerland where they are processing one uh, food waste and they are converting in nanotechnology. Yes, it will be change the world. Yes, but those people that are making a living, they are six million people, six billion people doing that. And they are burning the... Poly expanded polyesterine in the atom because they need to make a fire and, and cook something. This is the secret economy that we have to talk about. So there is a, a also a question related with the different levels of circular economy. We have a first world where there is a Japanese girl called Mary Kondo from Netflix that is coming to your house and helping you to have a minimalist life. We, we say hello to Mary Kondo. <laughs> so Mary Kondo is an is a absolute crack. Is a, Amazing. So she's helping rich people to throw out, throw away things, and we have the 60s, the 80 percent of the world they don't have not even a, a shelter or not not 80 percent. But so which type of circular economy are we talking about? The first world, like us in Europe, that we are boring, uh, achieving, getting now the new television, or and and asking for the Japanese to come over and help us. Or are we talking about the Colombian emerging middle class? Or are we talking about the people in Somalia or in other places that don't have even a sanitation? So this is one point that I'll, I throw in, in, in the table. And just to, to get back to your original question and connect it with yours, is, 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 it is true that it's in the details where, we, where is the devil, no? But there is a question. The complexity of society, of sustainability, requires a concept uh, called life cycle assessment. No? So it requires that someone start studying what is the butterfly effect of moving uh, one ton of rock from this place to this place. No? So nowadays, the creative and the designer, they have been for, uh, pressured by the market laws. So I'm a mechanical engineer, so in my whole career, everyone, I mean, the, the, the teacher, where telling me, okay, you have to learn how to 
uh, to assemble things the fastest way possible because the economy, the linear economy, is, is asking for that. So there is a huge gap in the education uh, related with the capacity to embed the, the design for recycling, the biomimicry as an inspiration for us as creative because if you are i'm i've been teaching to creative people design the product designer in, in many years and at the end if we are not uh, understanding what are the keys to to get our frequency of mind with them there is absolutely beauty inspiration uh, challenging and them or something before happiness happiness joyful, I don't know, aesthetics. If we are not attacking them, the, the, the creative people, with this kind of arguments related with sustainability, but we are just sending the PDF with 300 pages, they are absolutely unreadable, they are saying, okay, no, I don't want to do that. So what I launch here is the question, the complexity should be taken or take, taken in some way with maybe the help of computers. For example, there is a huge opportunity in education there related with the way you design products and there are plugins for uh, 3D, um, 3D design software that allows you to use the parame parametric design of buildings of products and set up some values, some environmental values, to be able to understand what is the impact of my choices. Because at the end, it's true that I, I should be caring about uh, the type of material that I use. But if I change the type of material, I, I need to change this, the thickness. And if I change the thickness, the durability is going to be affected. So it's like, oh my god, I, why I'm starting? <laughs> what, where, what, uh, what I did wrong to to be punished like this, you know? So we need to find a way to make it easier and the technology can help us. Yeah, my impression, sorry, it, it's been that when we're talking about circular economy products, the product actually looks simpler, but the process to get there was way more complex. Like with this table, it was easier to, you know, cut the wood anyhow and use the nails and a hammer and you know that's the easiest way to go this is way more complex this demands a lot more design and knowledge and effort um, but the product looks so much simpler and, and elegant yeah, no, yeah i agree looks okay, great if i just add one sentence is we Companies are looking for the benefits of the circular economy, but no one is paying for the investment that is eco-design. If you don't eco-design or circular design things, the circular economy that you are obtaining is absolutely bad. You know. So, yeah. wh and where is and, and where is eco-design in, in education in Spain or Europe? very few universities as this kind of, of I needed to learn by myself, thanks to Ellen MacArthur Foundation or other. Mm -hmm. So because I start, I start teaching eco-design because there were no teachers. There was no school. There was no, nothing. So right, the best way to learn something is start teaching it. I'd like to, to point back to what you just said earlier. Like, yeah, eco-design definitely has to be part of the curriculum of mm -hmm. <laughs> any level of university or, or you know, high school, college. Uh, that's a given. And um, I just lost my thought of uh, trail of thought. But uh, coming back to this product, uh, um, at the end of the day, still, you have a product that is aesthetically nice, is still functional, and it has added features that for instance, in this case of this table, you can dismantle it in, in small pieces and you can actually transport it from one point to the other in a much pragmatic way. And it's, it doesn't, uh, after you know X amount of years, this can be easily 100% reintegrated into the natural cycle because it does not contain any contaminants, any heavy metals, any you know, um, other types of chemical compounds for its treatment. And so, so with other words, we have something here. I mean, it might be a simple example, you know, because you cannot compare a, a table with a, with a telephone or, you know, a computer. 
but still uh, it, it makes business sense to do this and there's you know uh, when you talk with a lot of you know the private sector representatives and companies they always say in what nicola was saying like they don't invest in eco design but they simply across the board say ah it costs money it costs me effort and money right while they do not see it that if you don't do this right now your whole company is gonna simply become obsolete it's not we're not talking about efficiency we're not talking about increasing productivity we're talking about relevance we're talking about whether people are even going to be interested in your product or your service this is where we are in the in the transition yeah. you know that many companies have to start waking up especially in this region that you know we are already um, running 10 years behind europe in the aspect of understanding the concept of seeing the business opportunities and taking action on it you know so that is a key message to our viewers and our colleagues in the region that pilas you know you have to take action now and invest right now in educating yourself uh, approach all of us or you know figure out a way to, to work together and start investing strategically for your own goodwill for your own benefit and it's not about cost we're talking about opportunities a new uh, potential to enter new markets because the general consumer is not arrogant either they are getting more information they have access to more information they know what is going out out there climate change is a, is a topic that everybody talks about you know which was you know 10 years ago was impossible to think that it will come to this point right after movies like you know Al Gore's movies or all the other movies that have come out have have helped a lot in creating a general consensus and consciousness that you cannot bypass this any longer so uh, I am anticipating that this is uh, the train has left the station and it's going at full speed and if you don't get on the bandwagon you can forget about it you your business is just gonna become obsolete and and to give you a concrete example uh, when you know sometimes I have discussions with uh, people in the lightning industry right you have a group discussing well my LED technology is much better than the CFL that you have there that you're selling because of this 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 and this reason and these both do not even realize that if an architect realizes that circuit economy is the way forward and is going to design a building in a, such a different way that it doesn't even need to have a light bulb on during the day you would lose 50 share 50 percent of your share of your market so you both become obsolete so this thing is happening at such a pace and at such at different levels of society that if you don't talk with each other if you don't interact if you don't learn from each other you might be hindsighted <laughs> you can forget about it so it's not to, to, to shock people but it's just simply a reality that's happening and, and it's, it's happening at such a high pace that it's hard to keep keep up with and and so education uh, um, you know not education just you know in the in the official formal system but education as simply as human beings you know us three education. having such discussions for instance you learn from each other interact uh, you know we have to break the silos that exist like if i'm an energy engineer i only go to energy conferences and i meet over and over the same people and we talk about renewable energy i'm like okay yes great but have you thought about what Ken mentioned earlier? You know, if, you, if I have a solar panel, you know, it does a great job to convert the, the solar irradiation into electricity, fine. But it's a one dimensional issue. It's just talking about preventing CO2 emissions or trying to help mitigate climate change. But you didn't even question the fact of where the resources are coming from, how this technology is designed, manufactured, and what will happen after 30 years of use after you know it's done it has done its job and and in most cases it becomes hazardous waste and then it becomes a problem for another group so if we all start recognizing that none of us has a perfect solution and even as experts you know the more i know the more humble i become because the more you realize you know shit sorry <laughs> i mean sorry for the word but it's a continuous process of learning and don't do not be arrogant about this at all because this is way more complex than any of us can comprehend yeah mark dorfman was 
telling us yet that we're not perfect. We're just getting less bad as we walk. And you were talking, I was remembering this time that I, I was in the Ministry of Environment of Colombia talking to a person in charge of climate change, and she was releasing a resolution that forced the use of um, energy saving bulbs, which use mercury. And I re remember being like, no, you, you cannot. We have an almost clean grid. Our emissions are not from energy consumption. We cannot contaminate the country with mercury. But it went out, and we switched to energy efficient bulbs, and, and we've been using mercury until the lead technology came into the market. So we may have created you know, it's just a different nature of, of, of a problem, but it's like Nicola was saying, we cannot think of, you know, of one single, or, and you were saying that as well, one single area of knowledge we have to think you know, plurally about uh, several dimensions and not create problems in one and the other. But I want to go to what you were mentioning about this different areas of society and how this makes business sense it makes business sense to make this. I would add that it makes consumer sense to buy this. But we have a terrible barrier here, and it's government. Yesterday we were talking about how absurd sometimes laws are because they force you to use certain materials. They even force you to use certain designs for products and how we need to you know, work with the governments to convince them to be more flexible so that these new innovative products and processes can come in. You have worked a lot with governments, Kevin. Uh, what has been your approach? How, what do you feel it is our challenge? So everyone that is dealing with circular economy, you know, okay, th th we're all embracing this together. It's not just Kevin. I think uh, I like the, the point that Nicola mentioned earlier in the sense that uh, a very powerful way to convince somebody and to, to really get them across is work on the emotion mm -hmm. or their values, their principles. Because at the end of the day, if you don't uh, get them on, uh, on that level, you know, touched on that level, something will come in here in this ear and just leave the other one. You know, uh, because we are bombarded nowadays with so much information and everybody comes with a new term, a new terminology, a new, you know, even in economy, you know, we, we have circular economy, the new economy, blue economy, <laughs> whatever economy, orange economy. So, yes, of course, the general mass, you know, the common citizen is confused and it's like well, another one, another one with another nice phrase, you know. So... In the, in the public sector, most of us are the same. We all are individuals that have our families, our day-to-day, -day, you know, nine-to-five jobs, and et cetera. And we are motivated by other things than, than simply what we are tasked to do in our job. So what I try to do in most cases is simply what Nicola also mentioned, like instead of talking about penguins, try to identify things that are at home that are more relevant to them and relevant to their uh, responsibilities in this case of course at a professional level mm -hmm. what is your task if you're a lawyer that uh, you know is tasked to prepare a legislation about management of waste talk with them and try to expand the horizon and see and explore opportunities and say hey you could consider doing this in another way you could consider you know, and not being, sometimes you have to, to be a bit, bit, bit more direct and a bit more fierce. Mm -hmm. But most of the times it's about uh, turning on a light. Just, you know, touch with something that they actually uh, um, relate with. And they could say, and they start thinking. And they, they could go home and think, think, wow, yes, this makes sense. And then before you know, the next time you meet him or her, that person will be a specialist in the topic. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they also noticed. You know, <laughs> you give a whole you know hour speech about what circular economy is, the potential for the government and and your ministry, how how well you know if you're a ministry of productiveness or whatever. 
a competitiveness. Yes, if you do this and this, you can help all your, you know, the small and medium-sized enterprises and businesses to position themselves in the market and be competitive. You can, it's all about using the right language and the right words to, to lure the person into that field. And once they are in it, uh, it's, um, it's interesting. Then they become the, the proponents. They become the change agents. And that's, in essence, how things have been going on for the last few years in this particular region where since the early 2008, nine we started already with a, circular, with a closed loop cycle production program in the Americas when I worked at the Organization of Amer American States and where we led the first regional initiative on instilling the idea of what cradle to cradle is and talking already about circular economy, right? And now we see, to some degree, fruits of what we did in the past of having the one-on-one -on -one conversations with the vice minister or the director of X unit. Mm -hmm. You know, these are individual conversations that have led to like a snowball effect whereby they become, they start appropriating, owning the ID and start propagating it. And so it's not a, you know, a, a systemic approach. It's more like a touching one by one, people yeah. by people. Yes. And, uh, and I'm happy to see that after, what, 2008 and now, uh, 10 years, um, we have countries that are talking openly daily about circular economy, you know, having national you know, roadmaps towards the transition towards a circular economy. We, we had a conversation with the minister of, of you know, of Aruba, yeah. you know, talking about the, the circular economy vision 2050. So uh, you see a progress. And but I agree also with you that uh, writing documents is one thing, doing it is another thing, implementing it. And there's where we are. We are, we are I think, at the, at the initial stages of starting to implement things. And I'm excited about it because there are a lot of opportunities. And I think in this region, there are, there's such a large amount of knowledge and also indigenous ancestral knowledge that we've, as the minister indicated, we've lost touch with. So there's a lot of, you know, from if you ask any, you know, indigenous communities in our region, they have showed that they can live thousands of years, generations after generations in harmony with their environment, you know, and we call them not developed. Primitives. Primitives, right? So then you ask yourself, maybe we should look at ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, <laughs> are you honest about, you know, judging other people, judging other communities while you yourself have not figured it out at all? You know, and it, it, it applies to all of us because, you know, more and more I feel uncomfortable with myself because you identify me as a preacher on circuit economy, right? Right. Because I'm passionate about it. I really believe in it. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day life, I still drive a, a gasoline, you know, fueled vehicle, you know? And then you ask yourself, why? It, because there are so many other factors in life on a day-to-day -day basis, and one of them can be your financial situation, that you can not simply not afford a hybrid electric vehicle that you would love to have and and that would be more in line with what you're preaching you know to a certain degree so it's tough it's tough for us but it's tough for everybody so we all have to be conscious that this is not an easy task this is not an easy job at all and we all have to be on board because without concerted action this is just going to remain a theory the same place and well you were mentioning uh, that it, it may have to do with economic issues the way people make choices and I'm sure it has to do with it uh, yesterday Alexandri was showing us this diagram that makes different things and the objectives of sustainable development were at the very top and poverty eradication has been the major global policy goal for years and it still is right so circular economy currently talks to mostly economy and environment right those are like the two main areas that circular economy 
is addressing. But if circular economy does not address equality, poverty eradication, then is it one of the solutions that the world is looking for? And I would like to, to hear your ideas of experiences. You've heard uh, Nicola a little bit mentioned that, uh, the, you know, simple circular economy in poor contexts does happen and it's probably the one we should be mostly thinking about. But how do you see this role of social inclusion being embraced by people who work within circular economy? As I've been well thinking in the last two years, I believe that yes, circular economy, I mean, sometimes we need to fragment the problem to be able to take the problem, no? But sometimes we need to zoom out and see the situation from a, a, the, the global scale, no? So I believe that getting back to why do we need economy, that I've been, I've been embracing the concept of new economy in the recent years because I believe that circular economies are one of the perspectives I think is forgetting a bit the, lo the social part. At the end, we are in a human problem. It's not about engineering, it's not about nanotechnology. It's about also that kind of things because we need to provide people with the capacity to make a living or uh, the sanitation or those, those needs that are basics that they, they have. But, at the end is a human problem, no? it's an interaction with, the, with others and with the nature that we have to solve. So the concept of new economy like an umbrella that is considering also a circular economy, by my perspective, if we, need, we need to start talking about regenerative economy or uh, circular economy is already an obsolete concept. The question is, how far can we go before we start poking and bothering those big powers that are keeping the status quo as it is. The question is, if we aim to be uh, changing, we need a radical change in the world. And the education should be oriented to the proactive and provocative and lateral thinking of, okay, this is the status quo, and we need la such, like, like if we were the pirates, we need to attack the boats of colonialist, you know? So is the reason why I'm very connected with entrepreneurship, because I believe uh, we need pirates to take over the situation, because the roots, the commercial, the colonial roots are there, sucking the, the environment, as, they di as we did as European five, 500 years ago. So we need pirates to start attacking these boats and these roots and changing the situation. So how far can we go to be politically incorrect and start generating inconvenient questions. Because the inconvenient question is, why are we struggling to enforce a circular economy and no one is working to decrease the need that we have? Why are we not taking the consumption? Everyone is saying, okay, you have to consume this instead of this. No, I, I would like to say, no, don't consume, don't consume. Do you need it? Well, I'm, I'm not sure, don't consume it. So, and this is very politically incorrect because all the neoliberal concepts are based on consumption. Consumption, the linear economy is like a giant that is in a bicycle, it's like an elephant that is running in a bicycle. You cannot stop it because everyone is getting hurt of it, no? So, the education is to fuel this kind of thinking that the real true eco circular economy should be defined awkward and inconvenient questions. And young people, they start, I mean, we need to, 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 to think, why do we need things? Because at the end, the linear mark, the linear economy is bombing us, which is, uh, is filling our heads with, uh, with the needs that we don't have. At the end, it's a factory of unsatisfied needs. And as the Buddhists were say 4,000 years ago, is the lead, is the pathway to unhappiness. So at the end, we are living in an economy that is not fulfilling our, our real needs that are connected with our human relationship and the, our peace with nature also. So what, what is the, the, the next step? I think that we have to foster this 
entrepreneurial, uh, this pirate way of attacking the status quo from helping youngs to, to, to be defined the situation. Because if not, if we are maintaining the secular economy in a politically correct way, we are just incrementing. We are doing less bad, but we are not going, doing good because we need to start breaking down the system. And breaking down the system, we can do it from, from the grassroots and it's making out of uh, entrepreneurship, business, that have other values, B Corps or whatever. No? So I believe this could be a, a, a way forward. How do you see circular economy contributing to eradication of poverty? That's a tough uh, question because I agree with uh, with uh, with Nicola in the sense that um, we need to look beyond uh, what we're discussing right now. Like, or it depends on how you define circular economy too, right? Because if you ask, uh, for instance, Ken, he will add the sustainable yep. circular economy where he, he, in that case, intends to include all the other dimensions, you know, of the social equity, environmental responsibility, and, mm -hmm. you know, making profit or business development uh, or economic interests. Um, to eradic eradicate uh, poverty, I guess the, the conversation with, uh, with the African Circuit Economy Network in Asia uh, was intentionally, you know, asking them that question, like, mm -hmm. how is the situation in your continent? Because we all live under different circumstances, different socioeconomic conditions and, and opportunities. And uh, to understand simply, like, okay, what is their perception and understanding of circuit economy? And for most of the people that are still in, you know, in the bare situations, like, you know, in the poverty segment of the society, I guess they have no time to dedicate on philosophizing about anything. It's all about addressing day-to-day -day necessities. Because, we, you know, it's all about, okay, I need to get food on the table by, you know, for my family by the end of the day. So, of course, this does not reach this segment of the society at all. You know, they are just thinking, ah, these guys are just talking whatever. But while we are trying to address real life, you know, day to day and uh, even sometimes survival uh, needs to simply continue to see another day and, and have the hope that eventually they have the opportunity to improve their, their conditions. And so that particular group is probably fully unaware about what we are talking here at this table, right? Mm -hmm. And then you ask yourself, who is then responsible for uh, enabling the conditions for that group of the society to have the opportunities and chance to improve their lifestyle and you know their livelihood? And the, the, the answer is all of us. All of us in the sense that we all are part of the bigger picture and the part of the puzzle. You know, you have the, the governments, you have, you have the public sector that have responsibilities to, to protect the well-being of its community, the citizens, mm -hmm. and uh, create the enabling conditions to allow uh, other actors, in this case, for instance, the private sector, to channelize their resources in the right direction, in the right strategies, in the right interventions, and uh, stimulate also other segments of society to together work out a way that everybody sees a win-win-win-win situation. And that's a, that's a challenge because um, uh, Nicola also mentioned the fact that there's a, you know, an elephant you know, riding on a bike yeah. and it's hard to stop that. And you know, if, it's, if there's a traffic light and it's a red light, it will take <laughs> several meters before it stops. <laughs> so, in the sense of that, with other words, there are pre-established uh, agendas, interests by certain groups of the global society that prefer to maintain the situation status quo. So, and, and you're right, Nicola, I mean, to, to break this down or to change this is not something that is easily gonna, going to happen and not by having individual groups trying to do something about it. It requires uh, a mind shift, a paradigm shift. So, and it all starts from education, awareness. So if you ask me about coming to your question, 
the only way we can achieve uh, helping uh, solving uh, or eradicate poverty is by creating a general knowledge and awareness about where we all fit into the national and the, the global system because if we start making proper decisions in your day-to-day -day life automatically it will have an indirect impact for other societies in the in the globe you know it will automatically lead that there's less contamination you know for instance we know that you know uh, most of the things that are manufactured nowadays are located in asia right there's a particular reason why all the jobs and, and manufacturing activities from western countries have been moved to another part of the world to profit or to exploit the conditions that are there you know and now for instance china is reaching a point of development that they are becoming too expensive now so soon we will see another shift happening maybe to africa or somewhere else you know that that all the manufacturing activities will move to another region in the world so we still are stuck with the idea of that we need to have difference in wealth difference in you have to have a positive and a negative or you know or a, the, diff, the 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 gap in equity to allow this economic system to function so as long as you, as you don't change the economic system you would not be able to expect that uh, drastic shifts will occur and you will actually eradicate poverty so that's why when i was in un uh, general assembly last year in 2018 i was invited to talk on behalf of the region on behalf of the circuit economy platform and i challenged the the people there i mean the representatives i said you know if you don't um, take circuit economy into account you're never gonna reach the 17 sdgs without uh, uh, changing the economic system because the SDGs were contemplated under a linear thinking. So all these indicators, if we talk about you know, going in more depth after each one of the 17 SDGs, they are all conceptualized within a linear reality. Yeah. So how the hell are you gonna expect that things are gonna change? You know, so it, it forces all of us to be critical and don't be saying, you know, hitting on your chest and then, oh, I have the solution and this is the way forward. No, even the, the global SDGs have, are not sufficient. They have to be refamped, re rethought, re, re, um, you know, reconsidered in many senses. I have a question for you about the, the poverty, no? Uh, I, I don't want to be cynic, but do we want to erase poverty or do we want to create new markets? Because you, I have this Italy? doubt, I have this doubt, because I think the attention it has been, it, it might seem cynic, but it might seem also realistic, no? At the end, in Europe, we are bored by asking the Japanese to come over and throw stuff away, you know? And we are not consuming as we should because, well, the middle class is, is getting down or, I mean, we are getting we are fragmenting the society. So the question is, is the world prepared to receive other middle class consumer all over the world or not? I think we are not prepared because the linear economy as it's structured is for few to consume a lot, exploiting the, the most. No? But we are when we are starting to increase in this group, who is going to manufacture these kind of things, these cheap things there? Mm -hmm. So. This is one point. So my, I have no answer, but what I can say is that uh, I believe we need to introduce why those people are poor, are, are poor. Why is that? Because we take their lands 50 years ago to plant banana or to extract minerals or whatever. No, So when we go back, I, I'm very critical with this kind of thinking that we are getting back to the poor country and say, oh, we are again with our caravels. We are ca coming here to bring civilization because you are, you, they have been living there for 12,000 years and now they are poor. Why? Because we extract them the, the means of surviving over there, no? So this first, no? So, but this is a global polity, uh, it's a global question, no? But, and the other part is, it's true that maybe China is becoming uh, expensive, but there is uh, something that may save us, and is related with the 
the 4.0 industry, where we are starting to get back to something that is very interesting. Because when we were before the pre the industrial revolution, we were manufacturing what we needed. And if we needed, we go to the local Amazmith and we getting what we needed. But what happened with the mar with the industrialization and the the, the first industrial revolution. Then we start the linear economy and we are starting to fill in the market with millions of products and marketing to market them. No? So maybe with the new technology, we will be able to create a sack of pirates everywhere that are able to make a living with the local economies. So maybe disconnecting from the global economy, this is the question, because if we aim to create so social fairness but we are absolutely strangulated by the free market, it's not going to be happening that. It's true that our actions are changing the course of these lives, but not always if for a good, because sometimes we are exploiting too much soy or too much avocado, and we are destroying the environment somewhere because we are becoming more vegan or vegetarian. So this is, we are getting back to the, the, the butterfly effects. So it's very difficult to understand what is happening because if we are taking bananas from Ecuador and we say, no, we prefer the banana from Ecuador than Canaria because it's, it's cheaper, okay. So stop the, having the banana, the banana from Ecuador. What is happening in Ecuador? Someone would say, no, we are creating job there. Wait a minute. Why we, are we creating job there? Because we exploit them with everything and now we are giving them some piece of bread with that. So uh, I believe that we need to start from talking about local economy. Circular economy should be a local economy, local, social and local economy. We cannot think about a global economy where we are sending steel from one place to another. It doesn't make any sense. We need to empower local communities. The, the can gave earlier about the tennis ball, right? You know that it was used to be manufactured in the country, and then nowadays it's you know somewhere in Indonesia, and then the, the what it represents, the footprint, the ecological footprint that each of these products represent is absurd. And you're completely right. Going, you know, circular economy should be localized is the way forward. Why? Because not only you can start closing the loops of materials within a, a, a realistic, you know framework you know uh, conditions but also you engage or you facilitate the engagement between people you know because what you said you, you go back to a certain level of creating a society uh, uh, empower, empower the, the local people empower the the, the companies uh, empower you know and allow also the consumers to have the freedom to say hey i prefer to eat local or orga organic food and there's actually a system for it there's actually a, a, a value chain, or a, a supply chain in place. And even if you, you start consuming it, that rest material actually becomes a fertilizer for the same lands that are a few kilometers away where you, know, you can continue to grow food healthy again and start closing the cycle and allow us to finally figure out a way to live in more harmony or better harmony with our uh, in, uh, surrounding. Sentence. Yeah. <laughs> it says that I believe that the fu future is micro. Okay. Is micro, and this is another politically uh, incorrect issue, because uh, we don't need seventy thousand employees companies. What for? What for? We can have two hundred employees that is providing, supplying what we need in the local Valle de Aburra or whatever. So why do we need? multinational nowadays. I, I understand this is not <laughs> easy to say that, but why do we need it? And I believe that they need to absolutely rethink their, their purpose and their structure because they, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, you, it, this is like the third time that I can... You, you, you want humanity to think about going back to simplicity a lot. You mentioned it, well, right now when you when you're mentioning you know going small uh you were mentioning when you were saying going simpler and it's a way of going back and going back is a little bit and i do want to answer your question because that's one of my favorite questions poverty to me is in a large part another label we make 
people, some people believe they're poor. Now, I'm not talking about not meeting the so basic the needs, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So if those people don't have the opportunities for health, for education, yes. I do think that, you know, they're poor. We should do something about this because we need to have a just society. Uh, so if you think about the, the, talking about economy, the donut economy who has, okay, so here are the basic needs that need to be satisfied, but here we also have the planetary boundaries that we cannot go through, and we, yesterday, we learned through a published paper that we just went through the ninth of 15 planetary boundaries, and the just and safe place for humanity is in between those two lines. Like, you're being socially just, but you're making sure that the society is going to be sustainable. I think that sustainability is way closer to that lower line. So if we could all be a little bit poor and take off that bad sense that that label has, would be better. But anyway, we have only five minutes left. And I, I, we've been talking about how to get to the persons and not to the titles and organizations. And I would like to do that with you. So uh, you working with circular economy beyond being the proud journalist, mechanical engineer, beyond being the environmental scientist, something has to make you real happy. Something, something has to give you real satisfaction out of working with circular economy. You, you both mentioned an Eureka moment. What is that thing that circular economy has that makes you so happy that you just want to work with it? Uh, well, I, I believe it's, um, it's a matter of collisions no, in life. You collide with people or with books like the Credit to Credit that for me was one of the basics. And it's, it was crazy because at the end, just one book was able to change your perception of the 10 years af after, you know? Because if I didn't get to this kind of book, maybe I will get having this classical concept of sustainability, of efficiency, no? So I, I'm very passionate because I, I believe that we need, I see things not all of things, because I'm suffering the same that you suffer, that the, the, the more we start to understand and the less, and the more we, we feel that we know nothing, no? But, I mean, I see the connection so clear that I need to express them, and I need to help others, others to connect them. Like when you are reading a book and you say, this is what I was thinking. I was five years thinking about this, and you have the, the capacity to read a few, few sentences. So I believe that what I like the most is to try to do that and put in words something that is in your mind. And you already know that. I'm not, when, I, when I'm speaking, or is, I'm not telling anything new, but I'm just connecting something that you already know. But you didn't look well, maybe, or you, you, weren't, you didn't have the chance, or the time, or the moment. <laughs> well, my, um, for me, it's like uh, just thinking about uh, partly is, is the challenge, you know, the challenge is, is always an exciting aspect of wanting to become a part of a new solution, a new you know, way of looking at things and uh, combining the skills, not only of yourself, but of groupings of people. That's not for nothing that, you know, I founded the Circuit Economy, you know, Economy Platform of the Americas because it's all about uh, inclusion. It's all about bringing in all kinds of people of different spheres together and actually figure out a way to become part of the real solution. And I stress on the part of the real solution <laughs> because I feel that nowadays there's, there's so many, much things out there that proclaim that that's the solution for our future needs and the, the crises that are com coming up at the global level. And when, it, when you really go in depth in each one of them, 
you identify things that you think, no, it's just wastage of my energy and time. I prefer to dedicate, you know, the, the remaining years you have as a professional and, and that matches also your personal values and principles. Uh, that is what, what gets you up every day, that you, you know, you wake up and you, you're ready for it for another day because for you it simply makes sense. For me it makes simply rational sense to do this. Circuit economy, I agree that it, the word changes over time, but the principles or the fundamental aspects remain the same. You know, we, we all want to achieve a change where, you know, we address, you know, poverty, we address, you know, climate change, we address all the challenges with, that we have ultimately to, to create well-being, uh, improve the livelihoods. And what else is more powerful than having uh, the endorphins generated because you did something good? Uh, you, you can, you can, your mind is free of, your conscious is free. You know, you just feel like, hey, you can challenge me or question me of whatever you do, but I know that I, I did, you know, put the, you know, the, my little five cents into the, the pocket to allow this, this whole pro global massive transition to occur. So that is what, you know, what motivates me in, in this particular sense. Like, I want to be, you know, when you die or when you're ready to die, or you're, you know, you can look back at your life and say, oh, at least I did something useful with the time I was here. So yeah. that's it. That was great. I always think, and my psychologist once told me that we were crazy environmentalists because we're solving problems that are so hard to solve. So we're always thinking about biodiversity loss and climate change and, you know, these very complex things. But just like Ken said yesterday, we need to have fun doing it. Yes, fun. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. Okay, well, thank you very much. So much. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> and, uh, well, we have another conversation to close this event, and then we will see you in Aruba next year.